I'm heading to the top of Mount Herzl to visit the grave of the father of modern Zionism, Benjamin Zev Herzl, aka Theodor Herzl. Now, if you've seen my videos before, you will know that I love my country, I love Israel, I'm a Zionist. So it makes sense that Herzl, the father of modern Zionism, is someone I admire, but it isn't as simple as that. When you grow up in Israel, you learn a bit about Herzl in school, but it is hard to connect to his story. You know, he's European, he's old, and he wears suits. Why wear a suit if you can just wear a t-shirt? It took me a long time to even start learning about Herzl. It is much easier to learn about the pioneers who drained the swamps or protected the land or other events that happened here and are more exciting than to understand the historical process that happened in Europe 150 years ago. Today, this is a topic that close to my heart and I've thought a lot about what to say when guiding people around here. And I think, I thought that I had gained some interesting insights and unique ideas about Herzl. You know that feeling when you are trying to solve a problem or have an original thought in your field of interest and you think that you have unique perspective on things and then you find out that someone else had that thought already and was 10 times smarter than, than you? This is what happened to me with Herzl. Last year, I came across this book, Herzl, A New Reading, and I learned that all the great ideas I thought I had had already been written down 10 times better by the author. I mentioned this for two reasons. The first being to um, give credit. I'm a tour guide, not a researcher. I base all of my guiding on other people's work. I don't sit in archives and I don't dig up archaeological sites. The second reason is that the author, Itzhak Weiss, was born and grew up in France and only came to live in Israel when he was in his 30s. I wasn't surprised to hear that. It is no wonder. In many ways, people who live outside Israel can understand Herzl and his ideas better than Israelis can. I don't know if this is a good analogy, but I will say it anyway. If you want to understand the history of the United States, the core values of the Americans, you have to go back to Washington, Adams, Jefferson, but you also need to understand what the first pioneers were running from in Europe. You need to understand European society in the 17th and 18th centuries. Israelis need to understand Jewish world in Europe and European history in the 19th century. The basic story that is told in Israel is that Herzl was born in 1860 in Budapest to an assimilated Jewish family. As a result of the Dreyfus trial in France, a trial in which a Jewish officer was accused of treason just because he was Jewish, Herzl then started considering the idea that Jews ought to have their own country, and he started bringing Jews together under the umbrella of the Zionist Congress. He met with influential diplomats, head of states, and Jewish philanthropists to advance the idea of a Jewish state. Now, most of that is true, but the story of Herzl is much larger, as are his insights and actions. He was born in 1860, but not to an assimilated family. They were not Orthodox Jews and they were open to European culture, but Herzl had a um, Jewish education and visited the synagogue next to his home on Jewish holidays. Question concerning what it means to be Jewish assimilation, anti-Semitism, and the Jews as a people occupied his mind long before the Dreyfus trial. And now we come to the first sign of Herzl's greatness, acknowledging at a young age that there is a deep-rooted problem here. Well, you know, not here, but in Europe. Many of the first Zionist pioneers came from Eastern Europe and Russia, where there had always been anti-Semitism, old world anti-Semitism, directed at Jews by the church, by the authorities, by the Russian farmers. It was clear to the Jews who came from there that they were hated and many did all they could to get away. The vast majority of them ended up in America. In Western Europe, it was different. As part of the Jewish emancipation, Jews were slowly granted equal rights and Jews were flourishing. They had a huge contribution to every field that was opened up to them. I know that some will shift uncomfortably in their chairs when I say that, but never before had such a small group contributed so much. Many Jews really saw themselves as English and 
French and German, they were sure that anti-Semitism was a thing of the past, a thing that would go away. But Herzl, who encountered anti-Semitism at university from fellow students, said to himself, if there can be so much anti-Semitism in Vienna, a huge cultural European center, and not from old farmers, but from young intellectuals in the universities, then something is bound to go terribly wrong further down the road. And here we come to the second extraordinary thing about him. He did something about it. We all recognize that there are problems in the world. Some of them are closer to us and some are more distant. We tend to act only when a problem affects us personally. And we tend to think that what is good for me will be good for everyone. The number of wealthy people I've met who said that it would be better for society that taxes were higher is equal to the number of poor people who said that people should pay more for good health service and education system, almost none. Herzl in many ways was like a rich man calling for higher taxes and acting on it. He was deeply embedded in Jewish high society. He was a writer and an editor in the most important newspaper in Vienna the Neue Freier Presse. He was surrounded by some very talented Jews who knew a thing or two about human nature and Judaism, Sigmund Freud, Stefan Zweig, and Arthur Schnitzler. He could have stayed in that world, yet he chose to take a different path, a path that went against all the beliefs of the life he knew, and he paid the price for it. Many advised him to stay in the elite club of assimilated Jews who enjoyed the fruits of their success. But this idea of solving the Jewish problem left him restless, and he literally dedicated his life to this idea. Nowadays, we Israelis take Israel for granted, and all of us, not only Israelis, think about our world as being divided into countries. When Herzl was considering a state of Israel, there were almost no countries, just empires. It was 30 years before the idea of the nation state came to be recognized as the way the world ought to be organized as was proclaimed at the end of World War I. So the idea of a Jewish state was very abstract, and Herzl, maybe because he was also a playwright, was able to make this idea come to life in such a way that other people could share his vision. And when you see what kind of state he wanted, he wrote about a number of really advanced ideas. One of them was equality for women, and as a Zionist, I'm very proud that the Zionist movement was the second or third national movement in the world to allow women to vote. And where it is good to be a woman, it is also good to be a man. There is a reason why cultures that see women as a property of patriarchal families are all failures. Herzl didn't live long enough to see his dream come true, but he knew it would happen. After the first Zionist Congress in Basel, he wrote, were I to sum up, the Basel Congress in a word, it would be this. At Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I say this out loud today, I would be answered by universal laughter. Perhaps in five years, certainly in 50, everyone will know it. In his will, he asked to be buried in a coffin in Vienna until the state of Israel could bring his body home. And in 1949, one year after the establishment of the state of Israel, he was buried in Israel. Now Herzl knew that his life and work would be subject to criticism and misinterpretation by many. Because I've been here with people a couple of times, I want to address some of the claims made against him. Some will say that I've just confirmed that Israel was established by Europe to solve the problem of Jews in Europe. Well, most of the countries in the world, definitely those in Africa, Middle East, and Asia, were created by European empires. Open a map of the world. If you see a border formed by a straight line, then chances are that some Europeans drew it to best suit their own interest. And Israel is home to more Jews from Muslim countries than from Europe. Now, the interesting criticism is inner criticism that comes from Jews themselves. Herzl was criticized by assimilated Jews on one hand and by Orthodox Jews on the other. The ultra-Orthodox Jews said we need to wait for the Messiah and not take action. To me, this proves how ultra-Orthodox Jews have shifted away from the heart of, Juda of Judaism, the land of Israel. Read the Bible. It is all about Jews taking action. It's all about working the land of Israel. The Bible, and correct me if I'm wrong, says nothing about learning rabbinical text in Yiddish in Eastern Europe. 
Many from the ultra-Orthodox side love to point out the fact that Herzl considered the possibility of converting Jews to Christianity, and there is some truth to that. At one point, at the beginning of his public life, he was depressed by the suffering of the Jews. Many Jews converted to Christianity so they could get further in life, as at the time many universities, professions and jobs were not open for Jews. He came up with the idea that instead of Jews converting like thieves in the night, there would be a dignified ceremony allowing all Jews in Vienna to convert to Christianity and be accepted into society. Soon after, he regretted the idea and said that it came to him out of desperation. I think that it is okay for great leaders and thinkers, people who have created a new reality, to make a wrong turn somewhere along the way. Moses, King David, and Rabbi Akiva were also sometimes wrong. The assimilated Jews, on the other hand, were terrified of what Herzl was suggesting, that the Jews were one nation that would never be fully accepted into Christian society. Herzl wanted to have the first Zionist Congress in Germany, but the German Jews said to him, uh-uh, not here, we are Germans. So the Congress was held in Basel. The German Jews wanted so much to be part of German society. They made up less than 1% of the population. They contributed so much, and we all know how it ended. Herzl understood the tragic truth, that antisemitism is here to stay no matter what, that Jews can be blamed for everything. The capitalists can blame Jews for communism. The communists can blame Jews for capitalism. The Jews can be blamed for running the world's bank and at the same time for being poor beggars. The Jews are blamed for being a closed society, but they are also blamed when they try to assimilate. The Jews can be blamed for being too weak or for being too strong, blamed for not being a part of European society, and then blamed for European colonialism, for not being white or for being too white, for being part of the evil system or for being revolutionary. Herzl understood that the world was obsessed with the Jews, and he offered a brave and just solution. I will finish with a quote that was actually written 30 years before Herzl was born. It was written by Ludwig Birne, a German Jew who ended up converting. It is a wonder. I have experienced it a thousand times, and yet it is new to me every time. One attacks me for being Jewish, the second forgives me for that, and the third even praises me but they are all thinking about it. It is as if they are trapped in an enchanted circle of the Jews. No one can escape from it. Having a Jewish country hasn't solved all the problems, of course. The world is still obsessed with Israel, and there is anti-Semitism coming from the right, the left, and the Arabs. But thanks to Herzl, we have Israel, the only place where Jews can just be Jews, just normal people, without thinking about it. Jews speaking Hebrew in the land of Israel. Perfect. I hope you enjoy this video about this great man who we owe so much to. Despite his grave lying at the top of the mountain that bears his name, he doesn't get the recognition he deserves in the heart of the Israelis. Um, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a comment below. See you in the next video. Yalla bye.